Professor Gerard Libaridian teaches in the history department at the University of Michigan, and he holds the Alex Manugian Chair in Modern Armenian History. He is also the director of the Armenian Studies Program. I will not go into the details of his biography, which was outlined in the flyers you have already received. He is one of the foremost scholars in modern Armenian history, and he has put his scholarship into practice, uh, serving in several capacities in the government of newly independent Republic of Armenia. I would say he is a scholar and a statesman. For more than six years, he served as the senior advisor to the first president of independent uh, Armenia, Levonter Petrosian, mostly advising in foreign policy. In that capacity, he has gained first-hand experience in most critical issues, problems, and crises plaguing Armenia and the, re and the entire region. Today, as ever, Armenia is caught in the web of regional power struggles. Policies of the United States, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Azerbaijan impact on Armenia's daily life and also its future. We have invited Professor Libaridian to try to entangle the web and provide us with some perspectives in the future. At this time, without further ado, it is my privilege to invite Professor Libaridian. Very cursory look at our newspapers. The last couple of years, uh, we've had uh, four, five, six issues that are intensely covered. The protocols, Russian-Armenian base agreement, Ahtamar and Breiza for U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan, Matt Breiza, and is uh, Garapach. We should be asking who decides what is the most critical issue to be resolved. At the end, there are resources that are devoted to issues that are important. Where should the resources go? By what criteria do we decide that something, a statement, an action, a protocol, or whatever, is good or bad for Armenia? Is there a mechanism to look at oneself and, and our decisions and our analysis? Is there a mechanism, are there any mechanisms, by which we double check our analysis and see if we were right or wrong, and if we were wrong, why were we wrong? I do not see a mechanism. But we seem to be functioning as a computer that has its own defaults. It's set. The defaults are set. If this happens, this is what the consequence is. If you push this button, this is what must happen. The left margin will be one inch. The right margin will be three quarters of an inch. That's it. And it will be one and a half spaces, and it will be Palatino, and it will be this, and it will be that. It's all default. And that default does not change much, even if the thing does not come out right. We still continue with these defaults. Even when the thing malfunctions, it freezes, whatever, we have our defaults. And if you look at the big issues, they are mostly related to Turkey. We have a Turkey problem. The protocols are Turkey. Russian-Armenian agreements are Turkey. Garapal is, to a large extent, Turkey. Ahtamar is Turkey. Braiza is Turkey. His wife is Turkish. Yeah. And when we look at history and we say, what happens to us? What happened to us? Why aren't better things happening to us? Why did big things happen the wrong way to us, uh, we have the default line in the following way. Number one, we find anything wrong with Turkey and the Turks, ignoring or minimizing what could be not so wrong. We bring up what is wrong with them because it is their nature to be wrong, because they are essentially, in essence, bad. 
Nothing they want could be good for us, and anything good for them must be bad for us. This is the default analysis. Number two, we find occasional moral failure on the part of Western powers. Though they are not essentially bad, in our view, they have moments when they have failed morally, which happen to be coincidental with the moments when bad things happen to us. But they are judged morally. That is, for that moment, they failed. Uh, thirdly, we find a problem with Russia occasionally uh, because it is considered essentially good. But uh, Russia often has, in our view, for some reason, independent from itself, uh, Russia is unable to recognize its interests, which is to pursue Armenian interests. It is in Russia's interest. We try to explain to Russia that uh, you're not doing this right. Uh, you should understand your interests, which is to do what we would like you to do or what we imagine you should be doing. And then we've added to this the belief that uh, the Armenian lobby, particularly in the U.S., has the power to change U.S. policy, to change it toward Armenian issues, and therefore we have the power to use the power of the U.S. and translate it into Armenian power to have it pursue Armenian goals. If you follow our media and you know, follow our commentators, this is by and large what passes for political thinking, uh, when in fact political thinking should do a number of things. It should identify problems, provide explanations, provide a system of solutions, and envisage a mechanism to review itself. Having a state, having political parties, civic groups, assumes one essential point, that we, as a people, have a role to play in the making of our own future. And that having a role to play means that you have choices or you create choices. Otherwise, there's, if there's no choice, uh, then there's no role for us. It's all set, right? The problem with that kind of thinking is the kind of thinking I described, where things happen to us because the Turks are bad, Russians don't know their interests, Americans we think we can control, and Westerners in general sometimes m fail morally. The problem with this is that it assigns no role and no responsibility to us. They are responsible for every bad thing that happens to us. All that happens, or, or more importantly, all that does not happen is caused by outsiders according to our thinking, or because of agents and traitors working for outsiders. The second problem with this overall thinking is that this, it has something paradoxical in the system. It implies a system by which we understand the world. On the one hand, we tend to exaggerate our influence, proclaim our successes, and we assert, we we state that we have influence on this, on this, on this, and on that. We exaggerate the importance of Armenia itself in the region. And on the other hand, in our overall analysis, we deny ourselves a role because we do not want to take responsibility. If you are an actor in history, you also are responsible for your actions, for what you do and what you could do and didn't do for what you say and what you didn't say when you could have said it. The third problem with our thinking is that we assume in being so critical of the world that uh, we assume that we've done everything in our power to, pres to resolve the problems we could resolve within the Republic of Armenia, within the diaspora, and between the diaspora and Armenia. That we have solved our problems and therefore, we are free of responsibility, uh, but the others have not done their duty. It seems that within the system, our role is to formulate demands and expectations. The actors are those out there, Russia and the West. They are the givers, we are the demanders. Turkey, Russia, the West, and that's uh, undefined international community 
uh, that fiction that uh, saves us from more scrutiny. And we feel that our demands are justified because we see ourselves primarily as victims. We have the moral high ground and have the right to present demands and have the right to judge others on moral grounds. Now, well, we, we do have those rights. But what we do not have the right to do is to confuse the moral high ground emanating from our self-definition as victim. We do not have and the demands that are uh, easily formulated from the international community, we do not have the right to confuse this with political strategy. That is not political strategy. The more dangerous trend is to ensure that in order to avoid that ultimate responsibility, we focus on those demands and expectations that in fact depend exclusively on others because these will help steer people away from areas where we do have direct responsibility and we have a long list of countries and forces and individuals and bad people to blame when these demands are not met. And since our role is that of the demander without any responsibility for implementation or consequences, why not demand the maximum? What's the difference if you demand this much or this much? There's no cost to the difference. In fact, there's a clear political advantage to demanding the maximum. By demanding the maximum, you can pose as the most patriotic and the most sincere and the best Armenian. And for this, we need to look, all you need to do is to look at demands of our political parties. And this kind of mentality has started going into the thinking of Armenia, uh, the uh, leadership of the Republic, um, <coughs> just a few weeks ago, I read a statement by the Hanra Bedagan, Republican uh, Party of Armenia, which is the party of the ruling party in Armenia, the party of the president. Azeris, Azerbaijani soldiers had fired on the border, that there were a number of incidents. And uh, the spokesman for the Republican Party made a statement saying, here is the evidence and what will now, uh, what will the international community do now? As if they were guests in that region. Things happen to us and others are supposed to take care of them. Are we guests in the Caucasus? Is it our problem? Is it a problem? If yes, whose problem is it? If it is our problem, then we should go and solve it. You have to own up to the problem. It is their soldier against your soldier. Do something about it. But the sense is that it's the same with the solution to the Karapakh problem in general. As if it's not our problem. As if it's someone else's problem. And I tell you, there are some who think that we don't have a problem, Karapakh problem. This was the first incident where something happens to us and the international community doesn't come to our assistance. If this was the first incident, I would say, you know, maybe we'll learn. But there's no way this is the first incident. It's been happening for a thousand years. It's been happening at least since 1894-96 massacres, 1909 massacres, a genocide, subsequent wars. And if you don't want to go that far, in 1991, when Azerbaijan and the Soviet Union, the Azerbaijani internal forces and Soviet military joined forces to depopulate, deport Armenians from 14 villages north of Karapakh. We were screaming, right? Deportations again, hey, the world, look. What did the world do? Absolutely nothing. In 1993, when there was a lull in the fighting and Azerbaijan attacked again, what did the world do? I happened to have been uh, working in Armenia at the time. We had evidence of Azerbaijanis beginning the hostilities again, and we were moving into a higher level of war, which no one wanted. But then when Azerbaijan attacked, I happened to be the person who went to Moscow, Paris, Bonn, and Washington within one week to say, look, they have started, they have attacked. 
And what was the response? They said, what did you expect? We told you to make concessions. We don't care who started the war, who's right, who's wrong. We wanted you to make concessions. You didn't, don't come to us. You're going to lose the war, and then you'll see how it works. This was Moscow, Bonn, Paris, and Washington. They expected us to lose. They were surprised we didn't. But that was the international community at a time when they could have done something. The question is, this division of labor between us and the international community is very dangerous if we believe our own bluff. We are not guests in the region, and we are not guests in the world. We should take responsibility for whatever we have as a problem. It's easy to demand. It's easy to blame and demand a maximum, to blame the others, uh, blame Turkey for being full of Turks, uh, and uh, Turks who cannot do right by definition, we can blame the West for not being the West it promised to be. We blame Russia for not being what we hoped it or thought it should be. Uh, and uh, since we don't get what rightfully should be given to us by others, we are psychologically ready. We have the paradigms or templates to add another day of mourning to our calendar. We can always, we're very good at turning political tragedy into religious holidays. What we have done so far is externalizing our problem, but internalizing the hatred that comes from failure, the hatred toward each other. I admit fully that what I have presented comes closer to des describing a portion of our community, but it is the portion that is organized and speaks often, at least claims to speak on behalf of our people. Those who dissent or have different views do not have an organized alternative position. For the most part, the competition uh, for attention is between those who tend to agree. Therefore, exaggeration becomes the rule. So uh, I'm more patriotic than you. I demand more than you. In the last dozen years or so, we have also seen the differences between the diaspora position and the logic in the government of Armenia change, and that difference is diminishing. That is there too, maximalism, with the expectation someone else will solve the problem, is is increasing. Now, I want to go back to some of the issues we raised quickly and offer you uh, non-conventional analysis. Let's say, take the protocols. You've read quite a bit about it. Now, protocols, uh, we started working on those when, uh, in fact, in 92, the president at the time uh, instructed me to negotiate on behalf of Armenia a protocol with Turkey for the opening of the border and normalizing of relations. And um, we tried, and it, we weren't successful. Now, at that time, initially, there were no preconditions at the, in our time. Um, and then Garapa became a precondition for um, Turkey. In fact, Turkey saved us from um, famine in the winter of 92-93 because we were doing negotiations when the Abkhaz civil war stopped the rail from functioning, Russia to Armenia, and there was no wheat coming into Armenia. During the negotiations, Turkey agreed to allow European wheat to come by Turkish rail into Armenia. And that should never be forgotten. That is a fact I've written about, I've talked about, but no one picks it up, no one mentions it because it does not fit our template. Now, at that time, I remember very well, uh, the Turkish, uh, the Prime Minister was Suleyman Demirel. He opened a map, he said, look, uh, this is Armenia, it's Armenian territory, we have no problem with it. This is Garapa, it's not Armenian territory, it's in Azerbaijan, but Armenians live there. And you said they were not secure, you took it. <laughs> We understood that. This is Lachin. It's not Armenian territory. There were no Armenians there. You took it. You explained it's the security link between Armenia and uh, Garapa. What business do you have in Kelbajar? And he said, that's it. We can't take it anymore. The train stopped and the negotiations stopped. So uh, 
they said no. We had the protocol, 90% done, if not 99%. If it wasn't for Kilbajar, we would have signed it and opened the border. There was, I mean, that's at least what I can testify to. Then the problem is we tried in different ways and it didn't work. There were attempts on the Kocharian and then on the Seir Saxia. And we end up with the protocols, the two protocols that you are familiar with. Now, you have seen all the analysis and the question of subcommission, etc. What I'd like to point out is maybe two, three issues that because of our template kind of analysis, we tend to miss. There are two issues there, both raised by Turkey. One is the genocide issue. They wanted that protocol to say something about it. One is the Garapa issue. They wanted protocols to say something about it. On both issues, there were compromises on both sides. The genocide issue was not mentioned as such, but as historical truth. But genocide itself was not mentioned. But there was an agreement that it, there should be a subcommission within the state commission, right? And we said that such a sub subcommission is uh, a way of, uh, it can be a, or is interpreted as a uh, questioning of what we know to be genocide. We didn't realize or want to see that as much as it was questioning the Armenian position that it was genocide, and all of this implied, it's not explicit, it is also a questioning of the Turkish official position. The Turkish position is there was no genocide. We have all the facts, we have all the evidence, there is no genocide. But for that subcommission, they said we want to find the truth. So they put their own position in question. Whether we like it or not, this is how the text is written and to be interpreted. On the other hand, on the Garapar issue, the Turks agreed not to use the term Garapar, not to bring it directly, not to link it. And this was a concession. But the principles they insisted in mentioning in the, uh, in the text indicate that there is a problem of Garapar when, for example, they say the signatories to this document agree not to interfere in the internal affairs of third countries. But by international law, Armenia has interfered in the internal affairs of Azerbaijan. Whether we like it or not, that's how it is. There were two problems with these protocols. Number one, both governments being weak on this issue um, wanted to misread the documents. Turkey, despite all its efforts and, and knowledge, wanted to believe that the inclusion of the subcommission meant the end of the international effort toward inter recognition. But even if Armenia had meant it, Armenia cannot tell the diaspora to end the recognition campaign. So it was an unrealistic expectation, and the Turkish government was surprised that the diaspora organizations continued to push for genocide recognition when there was a protocol there. This was unrealistic, and uh, it, it's a sign of weakness. On the other side, the Armenian side thought that because the word Garapa is not mentioned in the text, the Turks have delinked Garapa from the bilateral. There was no such delinkage in the minds of the Turkish officials, and you know the details. Of course, the biggest problem with these protocols, in my view, was the problem of Hillary Clinton and the US State Department. Their insistence on the methodology of the resolution of the conflicts. That is, there was no way the bilateral issues could be disengaged from the Garapar issue between Turkey and Armenia. But they insisted on delinking, pushed the Turks not to include the Garapar in the text, and then suffered the consequences. And this wasn't something they had not discussed. In fact, three months before the signing of the protocols, August 31st, there was a meeting of what they considered international experts on these issues in the State Department, State Department and National Intelligence Council. And they asked this specific question. Is it possible to delink Garapal from the bilateral issues? 
Some of them said yes. I know at least I and another expert said absolutely not. No matter what the protocol will say, there will not, there can't be. It will come back to haunt you. And it's better not to do it, because if you do it and it fails, it's worse than not doing it. And that's what exactly happened. They signed, but then there were rejections on both sides, acrimony, and more mistrust than uh, before. All right. The Russian-Armenian agreement, it's a base agreement that has been interpreted as the greatest thing since the birth of Christ. The base agreements, there had been a base agreement before, the new treaty covered the bases, and then there are separate agreements on the bases. It doesn't really mean that much more than what there was before. It's a good sign. Russia and Armenia should have a treaty. Russia and Armenia, there should be Russian bases. In fact, in 1992, when Russia, the Soviet Union had collapsed, Russia was withdrawing its troops from other republics on its own. We in Armenia insisted that they leave it there because we had not replaced the security system within the Soviet Union with another security system. A normalization with Turkey would have been uh, a security system. Maybe not sufficient, but certainly necessary. But since we did not have that yet, we insisted on keeping the Russian base. So the bases are normal for us. They're essential. That's not the issue. The issue is not even why we go from 25 years to 49 years. Uh, but it shows that Armenia was more vulnerable. Russia caught it in time and used it to extend it. But it is a sign of the failure of diplomacy with Turkey. I'm not saying whose fault it is, but diplomacy failed, so you go for more security. But what is dangerous is to believe that, that uh, the Russian treaty or the Russian base agreement is a guarantee against Azerbaijan. It is very clear. There's nothing in either the uh, treaty or in the base agreements that protects Armenia from Azerbaijan or Karabakh. There's no such thing. It is strictly with regard to Turkey. And even with regard to Turkey, as any such mutual defense agreement is formulated, defense is not automatic. Even in NATO, if you read the treaties, the treaties are formulated in the following way. In case one signatory to the agreement is attacked by a third party, the attacked party will consult, will have consultations with the partner. And the partner will decide whether it is appropriate or not. And this makes all kinds of sense. Because otherwise, let's say it is automatic. If Turkey attacks Armenia, Russia must go and destroy Turkey, right? Well, you can't do that. That gives Armenia carte blanche to provoke an attack and then say, look, I'm attacked. And in no international treaty, there is such an automatic clause. The clauses are always for immediate, intense, or whatever consultations. That's what they are for. So the exaggeration of the meaning of that new agreement leads me to think that there are vulnerabilities of which we may not be aware. There are political and other vulnerabilities, and we are covering them up with the uh, extended agreement. Anahtamar. We've seen the campaign for a boycott. Some people went, organized churches didn't, uh, political parties were vehemently against it. And uh, frankly, I mean, I could see an argument, but I also see a contrary argument. Uh, particularly if I'm uh, a demandor of territory and my heritage in eastern Turkey, in western Armenia. If there's a peace, a symbolic peace that is being given back to my culture, that it belongs to Armenian culture, that Ahtamar belongs to the Armenian church, it belongs to the Armenian people, to Armenian history, and the Turkish government is making a gesture. I could imagine the two Gatovigoses, the two Badiarchs, with their president, political party leaders, all descending on Ahtamar and saying, this is ours. 
take symbolic charge of Ahdamar. Braiza. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. Braiza has a Turkish wife, so he shouldn't be ambassador to Baku, or he has received gifts or whatever. Uh, knowing, having known a number of ambassadors from different countries, I, I uh, wonder what uh, is more useful to me as Armenia or as an Armenian in Baku as a U.S. ambassador? An ambassador who has no relations with Turkey, has not accepted a dollar from anyone, but who in his heart hates Armenia and Armenians, or someone who has dealt, does not necessarily hate Armenians, and in fact is vulnerable. I like vulnerable ambassadors. <laughs> this issue came up in 1993 when El Chibay, Abu Fazl El Chibay, the president of Azerbaijan, was so weak, he needed to get out, and the only person who could help him was Heydar Aliyev, at that time exiled to Nakhchivan, but had become uh, the president of the Nakhchivan parliament. And Heydar Aliyev had called uh, Ashok Manucharyan, the president's senior advisor and security advisor, and uh, asked, uh, what do you think? So Manucharyan went to Der Bedrosian saying, uh, Mr. President, Aliyev wants to know whether we want him in Baku or not. And Der Bedrosian called me, so the three of us are discussing. And uh, Ashot said what had happened in the discussion. And I said, well, I don't think he's asking for our permission. He's just letting us know. He's too polite. If we're going to continue occupying territories, kicking out Azerbaijanis from their homes, I would rather have El Chibay as president of Azerbaijan. Makes our lives easier. <laughs> Makes it so much easier to justify what we're doing. We can't do it with Aliyev. He's too smart. If we want peace, we want to end. El Chibay cannot do peace. Aliyev can do peace. He's got enough authority. So we should go with Aliyev. Not that it was really our choice, but that was it. I mean, sometimes you want weak opponents idiots fighting you. I mean, fighting intelligent people is very, very difficult. Let me see uh, if I can, in a way, bring this together. There were opportunities, and of course, Karapal, the fifth issue. Karapal, um, I'm not sure what will happen. There is a draft, or a number of drafts there are. There have been a number of agreements, in, from what I can tell. I'm not privy to the negotiations, but from talking to people and, and uh, reading the papers and whatever, it seems to me that there's something that is ready and there are two, three formulation issues and, and um, sometimes one side, sometimes the other side, but usually it seems to be the Armenian side is the one that's not going along, uh, but the principles are there. So there seems to be something. The question is at what point, at what time, uh, uh, the governments can accept and declare it. On the genocide issue in the, in the protocols, what has changed between 1993, when we could have had a protocol where there is no subcommission issue, and uh, 2008, when it becomes uh, part of a text? that the Armenian negotiators, I'm confident, did not want it, but they accepted it as a compromise. Why did they have to accept it? Well, they were weaker than Armenia in 1993. If you compare what is coming up for Garapach today with what was possible in 1997, the September 97 OSCE proposal, which led to the forced resignation of President Derbedrosian, because that agreement was not acceptable. And the people, the, uh, those who forced the resignation included the second and third presidents. If you compare the two, the 2010 model is much worse for us than the 1997 model. There's no question. For one thing, in the new model, Lachin will be turned over to an international, to international control. 
There was no such thing in 1997. And that is for me the most important security for Garapa. The advantage of the new model would have been if it had a clear designation regarding the status of Garapa, but it does not. And they're trying to see if they've used the term referendum, it hasn't worked, they've used the term uh, will of the people, which is extremely unclear, and, uh, but we have given up Lachi in addition to the other territories. And that was something that was holier than holy in, uh, when we were negotiating. You do not give up Lachi. And now we're going to give. What have we done? Why have we given up Lachin? Because we are weaker. And for that, we are now, because we, we don't have that agreement, the chance of war is much higher than at that time. Garapal has been kicked out of the negotiations. That's a sign of weakness. The status issue, we haven't made any headway. Normalization that would have come if the 97 agreement had been accepted Normalization would have come with both Azerbaijan and Turkey, uh, and Armenia's political development would have been very different. We are in a worse situation than we were. The question is, if we don't do the protocols today, or the Garapa, we do them 10 years from now, what are the chances we will be in a better position than we are now? All the issues we mentioned, they're some extent obviously related to each other. Uh, and we see the dangers. Uh, but there's one that was mentioned that for me is the most important. And it is directly tied to Garapa and the economy. History is often marked by major events, uh, such as revolutions, wars, some legislation that passes, even a speech indicating a change of policy and uh, through these events, we explain changes that happen in history and society. But history is less clear in marking changes that happen slowly, drop by drop, with no specific beginning or end, no date to celebrate or whatever, but nonetheless changes that ultimately determine options and possibilities. The genocide, an Ottoman government determines for reasons one, two, three, whatever, to commit genocide against its Armenian population. What were the options the Ottoman government had? Why did it think it was possible to do it? Would it have been possible to plan and execute a genocide if the Armenians in historic Western Armenia had not been reduced to a minority? Let me do the final point. I see three critical, three, four critical changes that are taking place now. They are bigger than any Braiza, any Akhtamar, or whatever. In the region, there is an increasing presence, presence of Russia, and the United States is ceding the region to Russia, at least for the foreseeable future. The United States does not have the resources that it had even 10 years ago. It will make a deal. It is making a deal with Russia to have US and Western interests preserved at a minimum, and then the rest will be left to Russia. That's number one. Which means there's less room for the countries, particularly for Armenia, to maneuver. Then we have the decreasing strategic significance of Armenia. That is, the region itself is extremely important, but it is important as a region. The individual significance of the three republics varies. The significance in energy, in transport, these are resolved. Energy is Azerbaijan, transport is Georgia. Armenia doesn't have any, anything to offer anymore on that score. And the way things are developing, the third issue is the Turkish-Russian rapprochement. While for a long while Russia was concerned that Armenia would open its border with Turkey, Russia was part of the process of the protocols. 
Maybe not the most enthusiastic partner, but it was part of the process. When I used to go to Ankara to, this, uh, to negotiate, when I came back, there would be three ambassadors waiting at my door to see if I suddenly, by mistake, succeeded. They were in fear that Armenia might open the border. Well, Russia doesn't have that fear anymore. Things have changed. Soviet Union hasn't had a problem with Turkey all of its life. It has consistently reaffirmed the borders. It has consistently signed treaties. Russia has continued all of that. And there are such economic ties now between Russia and Turkey, including the uh, Blue Stream, natural gas under the Black Sea, uh, and trade and construction. And, uh, and the, these are increasing. Russia has resolved its problems with Armenia. It's got it by the balls. Now it's going to solve its problems with Azerbaijan. We'll pay the price. We'll pay the price, right? So we're losing options, uh, more indebted. And then what we're seeing looming out there, particularly with regard to Garapav, is a Turkey-Russian rapprochement. That's why at least the title I sent was Russia, Turkey, Armenia, another round. Are we getting to the point where we no longer have options and it's others who will decide? In my view, when others decide, they decide at your expense. We should own up to our problems. We should solve them ourselves as much as possible without any mediator. Is there anyone better than us who understands what is vital for us and what is secondary? Why should Russia? or Washington or anyone else decide what we give and what we keep. But this requires that we make sound decisions and take responsibility for our decisions. And we have to decide what Armenia is. Uh, is it a serious country? Small, but serious? Or is it a theme park for diasporas? It can exist as such. Enough people, uh, you take uh, Disneyland, it houses a lot of people. So we have Armenia, so we can go to Garnikeva, and we can increase the inns and hotels, better roads and whatever, and it can exist.